Hey, what's up, folks? Welcome to another edition of The Winning Drive. I am Lifetime Longhorn Rob Davis, joined, of course, by Lifetime Longhorn C.J. Vogel and the coach, former high school football coach at Brownwood, uh, Burnett, Capel, uh, Belton, Rotan, played college football at Abilene Christian, also coached there multiple stints, was on the staff at the University of Texas for five different seasons as well. He's a man of many talents. He's uh, also, you can find his work over at ShipleyRanches.com. It's Coach Bob Shipley. What's going on, Coach? Hey, man, doing good. Got my umbrella ready for Saturday, man. It's all good. <laughs> Ain't no doubt. Yeah, I, ho I hope the weather cooperates. We'll see. We're going to just – Act like those bad weather reports are not even out there. We just go, we just go act like it, it ain't happening, and that way, hopefully, we'll get some spring football. Uh, CJ, what's going on, brother? What are your thoughts? You, um, I'm sure you're hoping that these weather guys, which usually and gals, by the way, which are usually about 50% accurate, hopefully, this is the inaccurate weather report we're talking about on Saturday. Yeah, hopefully they're calling heads and it ends up tails, you know. I'm hoping that uh, for, for whatever the forecast brings, it's a, a sunny sky or at least dry enough to play some good football, get the quarterbacks out there slinging it a little bit. Uh, I'm ready for, for whatever comes Saturday. I think it'll be a good time. Hopefully, hopefully it's dry. Yeah, hopefully it is, and um, hopefully if the weather does come, hopefully it comes later on in the day after the spring game festivities are already done. So, of course, we're talking a lot about the spring game. We're going to take all of your questions, as many of them as we can. Uh, Super Chats, of course, disrupt the show, come to the front of the line. We'll always take that, and we're grateful for them. Uh, we'll also get into – we'll start off the show, as a matter of fact. We're talking talent acquisition. The transfer portal is open. The transfer portal give it, and it take it away. Uh, and the Longhorns uh, – well, of, they're trying to they're trying to get in some of those uh, those great uh, defensive linemen potentially in the transfer portal. So we'll get into that. My man uh, CJ's got some details. Uh, he already uh, broke the story that Billy Norton, Bill Norton, was going to be on campus for the spring game. Um, he's got some other reports about those interior defensive linemen potentially that could be of interest, of great interest to the University of Texas during the transfer portal. So we'll get into that. We'll also talk about the, the spring game, our expectations. Uh, we'll give you one crazy prediction that we thinking about the spring game too uh we'll also uh, dive into some practice reports my man cj has got some info some nuggets about some practice reports coming up for the guys uh, so we'll talk about the player availability you had three players meet with the media today uh we'll address their comments uh and talk about uh what they uh said about some of the uh the things that they're seeing about their teammates, uh, about where they are in their progress in spring ball. So we got a ton to get into, lots to discuss on the show today. But, of course, you're the most important part of it. So your comments, all of your questions, please throw them out there, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. All right, uh, CJ, gentlemen uh, and coach, let's start with the transfer portal, and then we'll get to some spring ball stuff and some practice uh, nuggets and also get to the player availability. Um, but the transfer portal opened up a couple of days ago, and it's already starting to heat up around the country. We know that the long ones do have a need at interior D-line. They already brought in uh, Savea via the interior D-line. And now potentially, my man Bobby Burns said yesterday that he believes Texas could, could potentially be bringing in as many as two more into the D-line, in, uh, in the transfer portal, if they find the right guys. CJ, what are you uh, hearing about in the transfer portal? What players are of interest to Texas? Uh, what players could be compatible with what they need right now? Yeah, I think two at the minimum. You know, three, wow. I don't think is entirely off the table. I don't think necessarily that's going to be the goal for Texas to go out and add three more interior defensive linemen. But there are certainly three guys that they're very interested in. Of course, Bill Norton, the interior defensive lineman from Arizona, will be on campus for the spring game this Saturday. We've known that. I broke the news earlier this week with On Texas Football that he will be visiting uh, Saturday for the spring game. Familiar with Johnny Nansen, played with Tia Savea. There's obviously familiarity in that system, played a lot of snaps, about 50% of his snaps over the A-gap a year ago, the other 50% right inside the B-gap. So uh, a guy that's very familiar on the interior. But today, two additional names entered the portal. I guess one was yesterday, but uh, two two names that Texas should certainly be aware of. The first is Dominic Williams, uh, a former freshman All-American, all Big 12 honoree a year ago at TCU. Entered the portal today, played 477 snaps a year ago, 53% over the A gap. So you look about uh, what you're trying to add from the portal. That's exactly where Texas is looking, uh, is a guy just like Dominic Williams, very disruptive on the interior, had 19 pressures and three sacks a year, or four and a half sacks, 
year ago, uh, excuse me, really, really active when it comes to uh, getting into the backfield and being disruptive in the middle. This is a guy who will be, uh, you know, pursued by a number of big programs. Of course, it is reported that he is expected on canvas at Oklahoma this, this upcoming weekend for their spring game. Right now, Texas is looking to also get in the fight for him as well and get him down to campus uh, before uh, the, the end of the portal window. And of course, today, uh, UCLA interior defensive lineman Jay Toya entered the portal as well. Uh, familiar fam- familiar with Big 12 play a little bit. His older brother uh, was uh, Mr. Ika. I-, I don't know how to say his first name. The big interior defensive lineman at Baylor who uh, oh, ended up yeah. drafted by the Browns. So he's in the NFL. Uh, younger brothers at San Jose State as well. Another interior defensive lineman. Jay, a part of a really good UCLA run defense a year ago, which was number uh, which was a top five run defense in the country. A big piece of that, 359 snaps, uh, 40% of that right around there came inside the A gap. So again, Texas is looking at big time bodies right now. That's a name I'm told that Texas is very much interested in at the moment is Jay Toya. And of course, with Dominic Williams, it'll be interesting to see what kind of fight they put up with him as well, considering Bill Norton is already scheduled to come on a campus. So those are the three guys right now that Texas is circling around on their interior defensive line. Rod, to me, Sarkeesian knows what he has everywhere else, and he's looking at this interior defensive line spot thinking that's not going to be the area that prevents me from playing for, competing for, and possibly winning an SEC championship or a national championship in 2024. Hey, and and isn't there a connection also with uh, Jay Toya with Johnny Nansen as well, right? Because of their time at UCLA together, Johnny Nansen being a, a D line was it the D line coach there, um, and coached him. So yeah. but, so Johnny, so your so your Johnny Nansen connection could end up bringing in potentially is if you bring in Billy Bill Norton and also bring in Jay Toya, you could bring in three interior D linemen just this year from that connection alone. If you add in Savea. And what what is the that is that the irony of that that is that you talk about timing the one position of of, of dire need for Texas Johnny Nansen just having to have these personal connections with as a coach that is that is amazing that is I don't coach I mean I know it's about it, it ain't what you know is who you know um, but that is a hell of a payoff an added benefit of getting a guy like Johnny Nansen uh, what are your thoughts though coach about the what does that say? If Coach if Coach Sarr ends up bringing in, and you heard CJ say, but two, hell, he wouldn't be even shocked if it's three. I heard Bobby say yesterday they he thinks they're going to bring in two interior D linemen. He already brought in Savea, and that made four via the portal. What does that say about the evaluation of the players that they have here on campus playing that position, and the and what they've seen so far during spring? Is that an indictment potentially on? the development of those guys or is this his coach making sure he's got contingency plans and insurance policy in, in place? Well, I wish you'd ask me that question on Monday because I'll know a whole lot more after That's the spring fair. game. <laughs> That's <laughs> fair, Coach. That is, yeah. that is. You, you know, we, we all know you can't have enough uh, – you can't have too many uh, good defensive linemen. I mean, you know, especially guys that somebody on the staff has a relationship with already and knows – so it's not like you're just grabbing guys off the portal and just hoping they fit into the culture. Yeah. You know, this is a guy who knows who knows them, is familiar with them. Uh, I don't think I think we you know we've already got one. I I, I look at two more. I I don't see three more, but I mean I- anything's possible. I would say if you bring in three, that's quite an indictment on your current yes. staff. Your current okay. uh, yeah. two, maybe you just you know you just can't pass up you know two guys like that. If they had to choose between one of the two, you know, I think part of the TCU kid maybe, uh, you know, certainly stat-wise, I haven't seen the film on either one of those guys, but, you know, he's certainly very active, you know, for the TCU uh, uh, defense. But uh, I don't – I wouldn't go so far to say it's an indictment, but I do I do know when you lose the guys that we lost in there, yeah. defensive line is obviously an area of concern. And it's one that, uh, you know, obviously Sark and his staff are going to make sure that they have they have all the bases covered on that. And they've, they've, they've looked under every rock that there is to find the very best fit they can to fill in for some, some uh, 
vacancies we may have. Uh, yeah, no doubt. Sark wants to. Um, there's no doubt. Wants to give himself options. I think they want a money. They want a money ball that position. There's no question um, right now, and they want to see which one of these guys ends up being the best solution for him. An A gap disruptor. I love the breakdown by CJ giving us the uh, the A gap uh, play uh, percentages of these guys and how often that they play the A gaps because that's what Texas needs. They got a couple of guys, a few guys that can play that three technique. They need somebody that can be over the ball and be a, a nose uh, nose tackle for him. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, Bill Norton, Jay Toya, uh, both of those guys, uh, one year of eligibility remaining for both of them. Is that the case? But Dominique Williams is, what is he, a sophomore? Or how many years of eligibility remaining for him? Just He has up to three years to play. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure he's the guy that you'll see on campus for all three years, Should wow. he, wherever he ends up. He's a talented football player. He was disruptive a year ago. Uh, he made life very difficult for Jake Majors in the guards on the interior of the defensive line. That's a guy that has NFL written all over him wherever he ends up. He's that type of player. Yeah, I mean, that's the guy's coach. I mean, I talked to Jake Majors about this. You know, which one of those guys, you know, give you the most trouble? And he said, oh, man, the nose. The guys that line up right on top of me. And they just want to give you give you issues all day long. And the guys who can hold the the point right there, be stout at the point of attack, and even reset the line of scrimmage like a Byron Murphy or a Tavondre Sweat did. Uh, Texas is going to miss those guys and hoping to be able to to fill that that void uh, with some of these guys via the transfer portal. So Texas will be busy in the transfer portal, uh, as CJ and Bobby said. They're looking to add two. Um, hell, maybe even three of those guys. They had three. I'm with you, coach. That's an indictment on the on the group. <laughs> and yeah. they ended up well, three of them because that'd be four total. That'd be four in addition to Savelle. You also added two. Yeah. Well, I, I know for a fact that this staff, the, the the standard is very simple when you're recruiting high school players or portal players. Uh, can this guy help us win a national championship? That's it. That 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 is now. Obviously, there are going to be a few spots where you need some depth. And you need to have some people that are role players. But, you know, the bottom line is in recruiting every position and kids at every level, whether it's high school, junior college, transfer portal, can this kid help me win? Can this player help us win the national championship? Is he a vital piece of the puzzle that can that we can put together to win a national championship? And so if we're offering these guys, then um, I think it's very safe to say that the coaches, the coaches have done their homework and feel like this is a guy that can take us to uh, to compete for a national championship at that position. Yeah. Uh, I love the way you put that. Yeah, can this guy help us win a title? If he can't or if it's a dispute, then move on, move along. Right. Makes it easy. Um, let's talk about the player available and get, keep your questions coming, guys. We'll hit all the questions. I promise as many of them as we can. Um, I promise you we're just going to get to a couple of topics here first. Um, but I want to talk about the player availability that the um, – that the, the players had earlier today. You had uh, Alfred Collins, Baron Sorrell, Malik Muhammad were the three players that got a chance to speak to the media. Uh, CJ, you were there on campus. Uh, anything that stood out the players spoke about um, that caught your eye or you you, you thought was uh, intriguing, worthy of uh, discussing? Yeah, it, I mean, we got to talk to uh, three guys. It was Baron Sorrell, Alfred Collins, and Manny Muhammad, like you said, Rod. Uh, Manny Muhammad had something really interesting to say, and I'd like to get your thoughts on it specifically, of course, talking about his group in the secondary. He says, we feel old, but we're young. You know, there's a good yeah, balance yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you, you see some of the older guys, not even necessarily old, but guys with a lot of experience. Andrew Makuba, Jada Barron, Michael Taff, you know, Derek Williams, and now Manny have each played two years or will be entering year two. Uh, Terrence Brooks has a number of snaps. But because of what was almost or felt like a, an exodus of defensive backs from a year ago with six guys entering the portal or departing for the NFL draft, now you have a whole lot of new faces. You have four true freshmen on campus that were early enrollees. You have a fifth coming in June. There's a lot of youth there, despite – all of that experience. So it's a good balance really of guys who, you know, have certainly been on the field. They know what it's under, what it's like, but also a number of guys looking to get their feet wet and get on the field for the first time. Uh, the com communication aspect of things that yeah. I thought was really interesting from Manny Muhammad was, yeah, I think that's one of our strengths and that has to be a strength. I think I look to a guy like Michael Tass uh, specifically as a guy that vocalizes just about everything in the back 
uh, end of that secondary uh, has been around the block a number of times, had to fight for his, uh, you know, role with the Texas Longhorns, of course, has fended off a number of really talented players at the position, figures to be a big part of it moving forward. And of course, was a great leader at Austin Westlake, and that's carried over to Texas. That to me is a guy I expect to see a lot of and hear a lot more of as we get closer to the season. But Andrew Makuba's uh, name was mentioned as well, just kind of being that vocal veteran. Uh, when communication's not necessarily there, it's Makuba kind of setting guys right, understanding where guys need to be, and just making sure that busts aren't common in that secondary, uh, which again, with all the youth back there, kind of mixing it in with guys who have been around the block, very important in that that back end of the Texas secondary. Yeah, Coach, I thought situationally last year, uh, that's where Texas actually was exposed at times. Um, if you go look at the, t- the two-minute defense, which act- it was at, at times an issue for Texas. They were exposed there. A lot of two-minute defense is being able to communicate quickly um, and being hive-minded, everybody being on the same page. On um, that time, Texas was not all, – all the DBs were not on the same page. So you had some coverage busts. You had some miscommunications, and you had just some missed tackles in that situation. Uh, if you go look at the third downs when Texas had to uh, go up against teams that wanted to use bunch formations uh, where they had to pass off receivers in coverage, um, times Texas had difficulty with that, um, with routes over the middle, um, passing off those uh, those routes to, in, to interior defenders. Texas had issues just being on the same page, and that's all communication. That's all guys talking to one another prior to the snap and your pre-snap. But then after the snap, you really can't necessarily speak. You can yell out keys uh, to guys, but they may not hear. You have to just be on the same page based on your prior communication. The Texas secondary really wasn't that. And I think a confident secondary is is, is, is a communicative secondary. It's one that talks a lot back there, whether they're talking trash to the opponent or they're talking to one another to confirm what they're seeing. Yeah, I think you're exactly right. And you look at last season and uh, when we did have difficulty doing that, I think a lot of times um, I'd have I'd have to go back and watch some tape. But I, the best I can remember, a lot of those times were were, were new wrinkles that offensive coordinators put in that yeah. that we weren't ready for. You know, and and that's the thing, as you well know, Rod, as a, as a defensive back. You you know, you can study all the film you want. You can look at tendencies. You can look at you know, everything that you want, all the stats you want, the bottom line is no coach is going to go in a game without any new wrinkles or any – or especially if they've they've seen situations and coverages that maybe uh, the way our guys are rotating or the way that they're – the technique they're using or whatever, they, they can see some, some fallacies in that and maybe some weak spots. And so those offensive coordinators are going to attack our defense based on what they've seen us do – well and what they've seen us do not so well and maybe uh not knowing uh for sure how to respond because they haven't seen they haven't seen our secondary respond to certain uh schemes or uh patterns or whatever and so they throw stuff at you that you haven't seen yet and so i think that's just part of a young secondary that's just you know growing and uh continuing to mature and develop but i know sark well enough to know that uh that they've worked on all that stuff relentlessly through the off season uh, after, after the end of the season, it was, it was obviously something when you look at the secondary that has to be, it has to be uh, fixed. And so I'm sure they've done a lot of things this spring, but you know, there's just, it's, it's just, just like us, for example, you know, we're going to, we're going to throw stuff at OU, for example, they haven't seen us do, you know, and, and we're, and we're going to make them look bad in some areas. And so that's just, that's just the chess game that you play in football, as you well know. Yeah, and it, it goes back to the comment initially that CJ brought up. The uh, they're they're an old secondary, but they feel like they're a the young secondary, but they feel like an old secondary um, because the more reps you have in that secondary in that system, and the more you've seen as a player when you are presented with something you have not necessarily prepared for on film that was not necessarily in practice, uh, you still know how to respond. You still know how to make the right decision. Um, you don't abandon your technique, your fundamentals at that time, and you know how to make the proper adjustments. You don't panic as a player. So that's hopefully that'll happen because you're right, Coach. Everybody's going to break tendency when you go into a game, especially big games, uh, based on what the opponent is doing. Um, but hopefully if these guys are seasoned veterans 
they got that experience, they won't panic. Um, they'll make the right decision and they'll be able to, to win that chess match within the game, but also that chess match, uh, the players that, that one-on-one chess match that you have out on the field too. So um, that's a really good point. And I, one thing that Manny Muhammad said that I like too, um, I think someone asked him, why is he so, he seems very confident. Where does that come from? And he said, I've been playing corner since I was in sixth grade. And I thought about that because I thought I was like, man, when did I start playing corner officially? Um, and by the time I was a sophomore starting like Manny is, and I started playing corner in, in like eighth grade. And then in ninth grade became like a corner, basically kind of full time. So I studying the position of corner. So by the time I got to be a sophomore in college, I'd been playing corner full time, uh, six, you know, I mean, six going on seven years, somewhere around there. If Manny's been playing corner since he was in sixth grade, I mean, the dude's basically going on, I guess, eighth year of playing corner, essentially, uh, when you think about it, right? So that, to me, that, maybe that is why he's such a kind of a technician uh, at the position where he studies the position. He's been studying it for a long time. A lot of guys early on in their football careers, they don't get specialized, right, Coach? They, the great athletes, you know, see, they're playing all over the place. They're playing everywhere. And I'm not saying he didn't play both sides of the ball, but he claims that, no, I started specializing in cornerback in sixth grade. Hell, Trevon Diggs didn't start specializing in playing cornerback until he was like a sophomore in college and then became an all-pro in the league. I, I don't know. I feel like that's an advantage for him, CJ. I feel like that actually is an advantage for, for Miami Muhammad being I, – I, I was a ju- I probably a junior in, in, in college by the time I got that kind of experience, and he maybe that is where the confidence comes from, but he's confident in his technique and his skill set at that position. Yeah, I would have to imagine so. And certainly in that district, you know, uh, at South Oak Cliff, you play some of the best area schools in the entire you know, state of Texas, but also in specifically Dallas, there's not a time in which you're really going through a lull at corner at wide receiver talent wise. So, you know, he's seeing guys all the way going back to middle school where they're going to be playing D1 power five football at the wide receiving spot, testing him time and time again, uh, that simply, you know, to put it lightly, it's not a drop off whenever he's, uh, you know, moving up to the, the the college football ranks. He understands what that talent's like. He understands what movements, what concepts, what scheme basically he's going against uh, because of the talent in that region, specifically at South Oak Cliff when he was there winning back-to-back state championships. So that's really encouraging as well. And it certainly helps, like you said, Rod, he doesn't have really the, the college experience, but the position experience certainly at more advanced than, you know, say a guy like Jelani McDonald, who was playing wide receiver, quarterback, safety, yeah. linebacker at times at Waco Connolly because they simply needed him to. You know, at South Oak Cliff, he was asked, yeah, just go man down that left side of the field. Well, we've got the bodies to play linebacker, safety, mm-hmm. help you over the top. We can rush the passer. Just make sure that that guy that you're covering doesn't get open. Yep. That's that that's beneficial in its own right. Uh, and it certainly helps, you know, per, you know, kind of speed along that progression a little bit. Yeah. Hey, you, sh- you show me, Rod, am I right? You show me a cornerback that's not confident, and I'll show you a cornerback that's not going to be a very good player. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got to have a short memory. You got to be able, when you get beat, sometimes somebody's going to moss you, and you say, I'll give you that. Mm. I, 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 that's, a, that's a heck of a play. I'll, I, I'll give you that. But it ain't going to happen again. You know, yep. uh, right. you have to have great confidence. And you have to have a short memory. But I also want to say this. I think it's so good, as they say, iron sharpens iron. And it reminds me back when uh, we were DBU and uh, when Jordan was a senior in high school and he was uh, committed to Texas, but he was he was kind of leaning to tech because Leach was talking to him all the time about catching all these balls, you know. Oh. And, and so he was really – he was really about ready to, to, to flip. And then Major Applewhite, I'll never forget this, Major Applewhite talked to him and he said, look, man, here's here's the deal. If you want to go catch a ton of balls, go to Texas Tech. That I mean, you, you will. You, you, you'll you break all kinds of records, you know. Go to Texas Tech. If you want to go against the best DBs in the country to hone and sharpen your skills, to develop you for the, for the NFL mm-hmm. – you, you better come to Texas. So you better look at your goals and see, see what they are. And that, that clicked in Jordan's mind. He goes, you know what? You're right. College is not my goal. NFL is my goal. I want to go against the best DBs in the country. And so after that, he shut Tech down. 
And I see that with, with, with our DBs and our receivers. Man, there's nothing better for our DBs than to go against that group of receivers they're going against every day in practice. And the ones they went against last year, Coach. Yeah, right? Exactly. Two guys that maybe drafted in the first round. And, yeah, if you're an NFL scouts, I guarantee you, they're probably asking, Coach, if they're scouting any of those DBs, they're asking, Coach, hey, can I see some of that film from a few years ago? Let me see that film from when they're going up against Xavier Worthy and A.D. Mitchell in practice. I want to watch some of that Isaiah Bond. That's that's just the real stuff. My man, C.B., I remember the glory years at Texas practices were harder than the game, right? I always say they were, man. And, when we, and I think this team may get – they may be getting to that point around 01 and 02 that our roster was so stacked that – uh, getting back to what you just brought up, Coach, about the wide receivers and the DBs, I mean, we were going against Roy Williams and B.J. Johnson and Sloan Thomas every day, really good wide receivers, all-conference NFL caliber guys. And, hell, they would get they got a chance to go up against Quentin Jammer and myself, Nathan Basher every day. And it, exactly. it was it, – it, man, we, we went at it. Our one-on-one periods were – that was entertaining. That was entertainment. It was some helmets off, trash talking, Coach having to – to, to restrain guys, get back talking, talking about quarterbacks having too much. Time. It was it was fun. And back then, our training camp two days was open to the public, so it wasn't like it is now where it's closed. And you, oh, we had people cheering, people cheering and screaming. Oh yeah, oh man, Rob B, you just got done dirty out there. Oh, we, oh, it, it was pumped up, man. It was it was legit. It was legit doing training camp. It was fun. But you're right, coach, about that. I think that's where you want to get to where. You know, and you go into the SEC, so it'll be a little bit different. But, you know, Georgia's at the point now. You, when does Georgia play an opponent that has a roster as good as the one that these guys are going up against every day in practice? Bama. Maybe the Bama game. They play the Bama game. That might be it. Then they get to the college ball playoff. So maybe three games a year, three, four games a year, and that's if they make it all the way to the college ball playoff. They're right. Ohio State's the same way. Ohio State practices. They don't play many games where maybe the Michigan game, all right, maybe Penn State, but they ain't playing many games every year where they got a roster that's as stacked as they are. So practices, that's where the comp, the real competition is happening. You got more NFL competition happening between guys in different positions at the Ohio State practice than you may have in some of the game, most of the games they play, unless it's Michigan or unless it's Penn State. Uh, and that's how Texas should be, unless they play in Ohio, Oklahoma is one of those schools, of course, unless it's Oklahoma, unless it's a Georgia, unless it's in Alabama, somebody like that. So, uh, no, good conversation there. Uh, all right, before we move on here, let me thank uh, one of our wonderful sponsors. Uh, we are very grateful uh, for all of our sponsors. We have great sponsors, but now we have a new one. And how about this? With Mother's Day coming up, don't want to forget about that. You may be like me, looking for the right gift, the perfect gift for the woman in your life. I got a nun, I got a mom, a brand new mom. I got a mom, but I also got a new mother in our house, six month old. So I'm paying close attention as well. So make sure you check out the carrotconcierge.com. That's the carrotconcierge.com. Jody Reynolds is a personal jeweler and she is the carrot concierge. You can see some of her beautiful creations here. Uh, you can use the QR code on the screen to see even more or visit her on Instagram or her website, thecarrotconcierge.com as well. Jody's an Austin resident, a Texas fan, and her family listens to On Texas Football, which we appreciate. Jody prides herself in providing personal service. She takes the extra step to make sure your lady gets exactly what she wants. And because she doesn't have the overhead of a storefront, she often gets higher quality inventory at the lowest of prices, as much as 30% less than what you see at a jewelry store. Jody has a number of different tennis bracelets, rings, necklaces, and more. All beautiful jewelry, all personalized for you and yours. Check out thecarrotconcierge.com and visit her website or give her a call or text and take care of that special someone in your life. All right, got Mother's Day coming up. Don't want to forget about that. Or you got a birthday, anniversary, anything like that. Check out thecarrotconcierge.com. And thank you very much for your support. All right, uh, how about this? I got, I got a question randomly about the spring game. Then we'll hit a, a couple of questions uh, here in the chat as well. Give me one crazy prediction about the spring game, gentlemen. Something crazy, something wild mm -hmm. that no nobody would ever expect. Just off the cuff, out, totally outside the box. Crazy prediction about the spring game. And don't say something about that. Don't be a downer saying it's going to get canceled or something. All right? don't do it <laughs> because of the rain. Don't do that. I was going to say to send everybody home and go to – 
go to the bubble and have a spring game all by the <laughs> Hey, it just yeah, just let just like LAT and cover it. That's about yeah, it. That's right. Everybody get to go home. Uh, you might be right about that, Coach. Unfortunately, you might be right about that, and local fans will take it. Uh, but give me a crazy prediction. I'll give. I'll start it out. Crazy prediction. I'll go. Crazy prediction. Out of all the quarterbacks, we're not going to see much of Quinn Ewers. I say three series max, and we don't even know how much he's going to throw the football. They may hand it off most of the damn time when Quinn's in there. And then you're going to see a lot of Arch, but we don't know how they're going to ha- format it. So Arch could be working with mix and match O-line or the second, third team O-line. Like We don't know how he's going to do that, too. How about this? Uh, Trey Owens looks as impressive, if not more impressive than any other QBs. There you go. Crazy prediction. Oh, Trey Owens looks real, really good out there. Look, just lights it up. Boom. There you go. Okay. He's got good receivers to throw to because they're so damn deep that he's still going to be throwing the quality receivers and they're going to be trying to show out. There you go. Crazy prediction. See, it's crazy. It's crazy. Oh, that crazy. Crazy. that's what I like. So I like that six total picks by the second. Day. Crazy prediction. There you go. That would mean, that means either Arch, Quinn, or help Trey Owens. They they having some bad days out there. I mean, so Owens having a bad day if that's the case. I yeah, don't know Owens what Stubbs. I don't, I don't know what Stubbs are smoking, but yeah, that better <laughs> hey, not happen. If, so, I guarantee you, look. If they get to three picks, Sark gonna rig it. He gonna start rigging so, it then. He no, gonna rig Sark it. Sark ain't gonna be fun to be around if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. What you got, yeah. CJ? I. I'll look at Zeno Umiozulu as a guy that gets multiple sacks. I'll, I'll go there. Oh, I think, okay. I think he's going to impress a bit. Uh, listen, he was a guy 6'5", got extremely long arms. Uh, the wingspan is there. Uh, we saw him in Orlando right before he got to campus. It looked like he really started filling out his frame uh, deep into you know the Christmas, January time frame around then. Gets to campus up to 255, 256. I think he's going to be a, a bit of a force off the edge. I think you hear his name – you know, with the sacker, two or maybe even three, I think he'll get after. I like that. And if that's the case, damn, they're deep on the, in, at the, the edge. They're deep at the edge defender position, man. That's why those guys are transferring. I see why. Yeah. If he ends up getting two, three sacks in spring game, along with Ethan Burke and my man Baron Sorrell, and, you know, obviously Colin Simmons in there too, Trey Moore, that's deep. Uh, Bo Texno says Arch completes 70% of his passes in the rain. That's right. They better <laughs> hope that offensive line backs him up. Yeah, you got to give him some time if that's going to be the case. Are oh, you going to run for 70 yards in the rain? That's what he's going to do. I did, I did. That's probably a safer bet, Rob. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, even Sark's quarterback, he can run for days. Yeah, and basically Sark admitted that he he runs a little too much for Sark. Didn't Sark y'all heard, heard that when Sark mentioned that? He almost implied he runs a little too much for me. I want him to stay in the pocket well, and make some throws. Oh, but Arch likes to run. Arch likes to run, baby. He wants to he run. He does. He, Sark, I actually picked it up from Sarkeesian – on Tuesday when he said he had his best practice of the spring. Yeah. Why was that? Well, well, he's stepping up in the pocket. <laughs> so there it is. He's not, you know, sitting there quick to bolt out, you know, and letting yeah. his legs do the work. So that's the next step for Arch Manning. Because let's, again, look at where Arch was in high school. He wasn't playing behind 300-pound offensive linemen. That's he good. wasn't playing, you know, behind 280-pound offensive linemen. He was basically playing behind me with a, a backpack on, you know, that's how much weight those guys are blocking for him in front of them uh, down there in new Orleans. So getting used to guys in front of him, creating that pocket and trusting the five guys is going to be big for his development. Again, last year, we didn't see a whole lot of that in live situations. He was working with yeah. guys where still trying to figure out what their strengths were on the offensive line, very young, very inexperienced. Now that we'll get some, you know, a look or two, probably I would expect a, a series or two with arch in that first group. Then you get a true idea of what it's like for him to play behind a Kelvin Banks, a Cam Williams, a DJ Campbell. Yeah. Then you'll really get an idea of what kind of quarterback he can be and is at the moment. Uh, here you go. Isaac says, I'll give you one more, Rod. Trey Owens connects with Livingstone for a touchdown. Hey, I, I, I'm i with you on that. I agree. That's part of what my crazy predictions. I'll tell you, I, I think Trey, Trey Owens, he, he's, he's, he's cocky, but in a good way. He's the, 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 the kind of where you want your quarterback. And I guarantee he's going to go out there and show out. He's and, and there's a reason, you know, Sark kind of Sark, Sark jumped on him early before he became the Houston, you know, offensive player of the year. He was on him before that. So I think Sark saw what I saw and saw what I think a lot of people do. He's got a cannon of an arm. And then when you go talk to him, 
he's got that it. He's got some of that it quality, man. He's, he's oozing some of that it quality. And that's what you want from QB. So I like that. I like that, Isaac. Good one. Uh, that would have been the second week in a row if that happens. It happened last true. week, 45 yards. That's what I'm saying. They, dude, I'm telling you, I like it. I, I, I like that, man. I like that connection. That may be one early to start. All right, Coach, you got a crazy prediction for the people out there? Not too crazy, but it's crazy for me because I know what y'all are thinking I'm going to say. It's all about the wide receivers. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm going to tell you this. I feel a little bit like Lee Corso here, baby. I'm going to tell you, you don't know what's coming. You don't know what's coming. If you don't know who he is now, you will know who he is after the game. He wears number 11, Colin Simmons. Is going to mm. make a name for himself. There, he's going to play so well in the spring game. My crazy prediction is they're going to be selling number eleven jerseys in the co-op, <laughs> and that ain't Derek Johnson. Oh, I mean, Derek Johnson should, could, and maybe should have his number retired, in my opinion. But I right now, that. it's not. It's not retired. Colin Simmons is about to make it famous again. Man, I love that. Hey, I, hey, hey, okay, so if that is the case, and CJ is right, too, about his wild prediction. Both of y'all went with the edge, with the edge defender. Freshman edges. Right, freshman edges. Is it fair to say that one of the things that we can all, I think, be able to, even people here on uh, watching uh, on Texas football right now, even if you're not – coach and you don't have the football knowledge of coach or myself or cj everybody can recognize bgo ball get off like you get look looking at the, when the ball is snapped and who's getting off the ball first it's real easy to see things like oh that guy that guy was first off the ball i think that's going to be different on the edges this year i think it's going to be better for first of all for the vets uh baron sorrell and ethan burke but i think looking at what trey moore brings you brought up uh, Zena Emil Zulu, uh, Coach. You brought up Colin Simmons, the prodigy. Them dudes are different. Their BGO is different. And I think you're going to notice that. And and how about this? Kenny Baker. How about this crazy prediction? One of Bob's grandsons suits up for the spring game. <laughs> Can we get a Shipley in there, man? Let's get another Shipley on the campus, baby. Co- come on, Coach. Which one? Which one's closest? Which one of them grandkids is closest? What they mean? Stone. Stone really? Shipley. Stone, Stone Shipley. Shipley. Remember that name. That's okay. Jackson's. That, that's my oldest grandson. That's Jackson's boy. He All got right. him playing seven on seven about every night of the week, man. <laughs> every weekend. That dude, he's he's a receiver. And, okay. uh, he I, doesn't I, have I, hands I, like his name, Coach, right? <laughs> he's going to be, but the boy loves him some football. I know that. Oh, he be, he should be one of the Shipleys that plays defense. Yeah. He should be a Shipley well, that plays safety, though. Stone Shipley. Here, here, yeah. Here's a here's what Jack Jackson is out there with him working every day. Uh-oh. They work in the yard or on the field Ooh. almost every single what? day. Footwork stone, stuff, football stuff. Stone Stone loves it. He loves yeah. everything about it, and he's playing with some really talented young players in that little seven on seven. And so he he had a wake up call his first year, but he he's he's starting to spread his wings a little bit. I I don't know if he'll ever get on the forty, but he's the best I got at this point. Ooh, Rod, okay. you know he's like never going to learn how to backpedal. He's going forward. No, he's got the, the cutters on his hands. He ain't never playing <laughs> yeah, defense right. there. That's for sure. Yeah, he's going to a, a superb route run. He's already working footwork drills. Oh, <laughs> he's been, he's been, <laughs> been doing that to walk. <laughs> hey coach how old is he again how old is he he just turned eight i guarantee you at eight he already knows the route tree i oh, guarantee, I guarantee, you, you, I guarantee get... you he does. <laughs> i mean like that give me a six route son all right <laughs> yeah i guarantee you he does that's oh, awesome that's great i love it see there you go look out for it hey, it's an easy name to remember stone shipley baby i like that that's a good name too by the way that's the name of a star I don't know what he's gonna be a star in. Oh, it could be sports, it could be something else, but that's a that's a that's a celebrity name right there, man. Stone Shipley. Um, but no, getting back to the to the edges at the BGO, watch out. It's one thing we can look out for. We can talk about you know what we expect to improve, what what areas we expect to see improvement um from this Texas football team from last year just to this spring game and just that that offseason, the the, the obviously the spring part of the off season. And I think honestly, BGO is just that simple. You're going to see better ball get off on the edges 
period. Um, because they're built different now. They're the guys they brought in are they have a different type of twitchy quickness um, off of the edge now. So that's so I, I, both you guys' prediction. Hopefully, I hope y'all are right about that. And that would also, you know, lend more credence to the argument of why those two guys left, Jamon Tap and Billy Wallen's like, no man, they're deep. That's why we left. I ain't, I'm trying to add a path to play, and I don't really see it in the next year or so with how deep they are on the edge right now. Um, all right. Uh, good stuff there, guys. All right. I want to hit some questions here and then we'll come back. Cause I know my man CJ has got a couple of practice nuggets that I want to get into as well. Um, Cause CJ is just as connected as anybody and always dropping great info for us. So I want to get into that coming up, but first let's hit some of these questions. Um, how about this one uh, from my man, UT boy, UT boy, shout out. Love me some UT boy all the time over under on Jante's touchdowns. <laughs> Two. What we got? We got over on the CJ. John Tate cooks touchdowns, baby. What, what we got here? You keep yeah, I'd love for him to hit that over. That's going to be a tough thing to do with all these new faces, all these new wide receivers in the fold. I'm sure Sharkeesian's going to find a way to, you know, kind of highlight, you know, some of these newcomers, uh, Ryan Wingo, uh, Isaiah Bond, you know, kind of getting the fans excited. John Tate had one last year. Yeah. Let's not forget, he probably had, what was it, a 60-yard touchdown from Malik uh, Murphy a year ago. So he's got the experience in scoring in the spring game. I'd like to see him hit two, uh, but it's going to be a tall stretch. All right. Yeah, Coach, what are your thoughts about Jonte Cook? Who, okay, how about this? Who's going to be the leading receiver? I'll just take that question and add to it from UT Boy. Who's the leading receiver in the spring game? Who are we throwing out there? Leading receiver when it's all said and done. You know, I, I'm asking the right man. That's I'm going to say John T. Cook. Oh, you made UT boys day. <laughs> I, 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 hey, I mean, everybody's talking about these transfers, and we got one that may be as good as any of them. Yeah. You know, and, and, and he knows all the hype that's been going on about these transfers. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, going to be a great opportunity for him to show what he can do. But as we talked about last week, or I guess it was Monday, we talked about the fact that, that uh, all those new guys are going to want to show the, the, the their new fan base what they can do. It doesn't matter if they played in Alabama. It doesn't matter where they played. They're, they're going to want to show the home crowd what they can do too. But uh, I, I, I say UT boy is right, and uh, John T. Cook is, gonna, is going to uh, make a name for himself, and people will remember him and stop talking about all these transfers. Home Homegrown boy. Hey, I like that. UT boy is loving that. I like that. He loves it. What about you, CJ? You going the same route? Who, who you think will be the leading receiver when it's all said and done to, uh, on, on Saturday? I'm going the portal route, Coach. Okay. I am. I'm going with Matthew Golden. I've heard great things about him so far. Uh, I, again, I, I was talking to a buddy of mine that you know uh, earlier this week who got to see Matthew Golden in practice for a full uh, session. He just again, just very smooth off the line of scrimmage. Uh, we had the conversation of who's going to be that safety blanket, mm -hmm. a Jordan Whittington, a guy that you need, you know, yep. in that third and five to third and seven region, who's going to be that guy that finds, you know, open areas in the zone or beats his man quickly and still finds ways to uh, find the first down. Listen, we saw Jordan Whittington do it time and time again, a year ago, last year, that was kind of where Matthew Golden made his, his money at Houston. He was that underneath guy that after the catchability guy, I think in this role, you won't see him as much underneath, yeah. but he'll still have, you know, some of the, that responsibility in the route tree. I think Matthew Golden right now with what we've heard from Quinn talk about him and uh, Steve Sarkeesian talk about him. He's going to be that sure handed guy, that reliable piece that you can use underneath a guy like Isaiah Bond or a John T. Cook that kind of finds the open areas of a zone. I think he'll have a long day on Saturday and I think he'll be uh, able to find some success with not only Quinn, but uh, with Arch as well. Well, I like that. I'm going to go. All right. You know what? You guys both had good, good options there. Good suggestions. I'll go with a young Ryan Wingo. And I think it's all off mostly off one big play. But I think a young Ryan Wingo off one big play just has a, a big post route, double move down the sideline. I think we're going to have a lot of deep shots. Uh, I think, Coach, what did you say? Over under on deep shots for you is going to be seven. Seven, seven deep shots the whole game. I, I think I'm close to nine, like nine, right on nine deep shots. Maybe three for all three of the quarterback. They all get three apiece. Uh, but I think Ryan Wingo is going to be the beneficiary one of them. So I'll go with Ryan Wingo. But like I said most of it off one big play. I have three catches, but you know he'll 40, 50 of them on one, you know, of those yards on one big play. So I'll go Wingo. 
I'm really excited about that. All right. Uh, thanks for the, 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 the question, UT boy. We appreciate it as always. Uh, how about this one from Alan? And I like this. It's almost a would you rather. Um, what will get you more excited? Three touchdown passes in tight coverage or one to two interceptions on really good tight window throws on good passes. Hmm. I, yeah, only, I, know. I really wonder where you're going to go, Rod and Coach. I really <laughs> wonder where you're going to go. <laughs> I'm going to go. Well, I'll start out. What will get me more excited would be the interceptions and really tight coverage. Um, and I know because you know, all spring game, you know, analysis is glass half full, glass half empty. I mean, if you're excited about the way the receivers perform, then you got to be a little depressed about the DBs uh, and vice versa, whatever. All right. So I'll go with the DBs only because. Last year, your Achilles heel essentially was pass defense. That's what was that was your biggest liability defensively. Um, that's why you lost the Oklahoma game. It's a big part of why you lost to Washington. Just couldn't hold up in pass defense. Sark wants to play more man coverage. He stated that they want to play stickier coverage. They want to be tighter in man coverage, play more press coverage if possible, disrupt the timing of routes, allow the defensive edges to be able to get home and and and, and get in the backfield and collapse the pocket and, and potentially get sacks on the quarterback, force more negative plays. So I would be more excited about the interceptions and the plays they make on the ball because they haven't done that since Sark has been here, guys. When was the last secondary Texas had that went after the football like that? I think we got to go back to, man, because it's a PK. PK has this defense has gotten gradually better every year. It's gotten so last year was awesome. They were really good. That front seven was one of the best in the in the country. One of the best actually in recent Texas football history. But the secondary was still a liability. You got to go back to kind of like Todd Orlando's first season as a defensive coordinator. Finding the last time the secondary was was full of a bunch of ball hawks. Right, that that went after the football. It, it's been a while on the four acres since you've had that kind of secondary. Right, that was that had to be like twenty like seventeen or something like that. And that's what you need. You got Malik Muhammad. He's a ball hawk in his secondary. I think the Jay Barron's guy. He's a great football investigator. Makuba is a is a is a disruptor. Makes a lot of plays, uh, but I don't know about on the football. It'd be great to see those guys, Terrence Brooks, some of those young players, start making plays on the football. So I'll go that route. What about you, CJ? Yeah, I'm going to go the same route. Again, it's just kind of that gradual step. We know Quinn Ewers is going to be good. We know the offense line will provide protection. Uh, we know Texas has a number of really talented wide receivers. It would be great to see them get into a rhythm with Quinn and those new guys. Uh, but to your point, Rod, that that secondary and really the deep ball a year ago was what you know prevented Texas from hitting its ultimate ceiling. Uh, I'd like to see more hands on passes and coming away with turnovers would certainly set a good – uh, I, I guess standard for going into the spring or into the summer months of what we know this defense can accomplish with help on the way that we figure to be up front. Yep. All right. I know y'all think I'm going to be like the, the farmer assistant coach. All right. <laughs> that farmer assistant coach on water boy, you know, wearing his overall <laughs> rubbing his nipples, you know, with that ball in the air on those deep, deep touchdown passes. Okay. Slow motion. I could just see it. But that ain't, but that ain't, but that ain't what we need. What we need is some DBs picking off some passes from these big time quarterbacks and receivers. And so that's going to make me happier. I, I, I think, I think all three of us agree that we need to see our defensive backs progress to the point where they're breaking on the ball and making big plays, especially when we're going ones, you know, when we're going against that good offense, um, we need to see some DBs make some plays. And that would make me very happy. Yep. Yeah. Well, I'm, hey, I'm surprised we're all on the same page. That's rare. There you go. So thank you for the question, Alan. We appreciate that. Uh, another question here uh, from James that I think is a pretty good one. And I, 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 I want to throw this at CJ because I know CJ's talked a lot about this young man. We usually hear great things about Anthony Hill. I was curious about uh, how LaFau has looked so far since the start of spring. Yeah. Um, I know you were big on Leonga LaFau contending to win that job opposite Anthony Hill, CJ, what have you heard about Leon LaFowle's progress so far? Yeah, no, he's had a good spring. Interestingly enough, uh, I was expecting, like you said, Rod, for LaFowle to be in that, you know, that position to really make a run for that, you know, interior defensive line spot, or uh, sorry, that extra linebacking spot next to Anthony Hill. So David Bendis credit, he's done a tremendous job yeah. of holding him off. 
And it's not because of a lack of progression or development with LaFowle's game. It's because Ben has been that guy to say, yeah, I'm, you know, the oldest guy in the room here. This is my time truly to step on the field and make it my own. And he's done a, a very good job at that so far this spring. LaFowle, again, trimming down about 10 pounds from a year ago, I think is going to help him in mm -hmm. terms of just maintaining that ability to move laterally, the quickness coming downhill, and of course, in the passing game, he'll add back up before we get to uh, the season this fall, right around 220 at the moment. He'll get up to about 227, uh, 228 by the time week one rolls around. Just so you know, again, Texas has two guys with Hill and Benda that are right around 240. That's big. But yeah. fortunately, both of them can run very well. For uh, LaFau to get to that range, he has to make sure it's a steady climb, not something that he uh, sees overnight or very quickly. I think he'll be a, a, a rotational piece in the middle of that defense. Uh, and I think he'll have a great opportunity with extended snaps on Saturday to make another strong impression in front of a home crowd. Yeah, uh, it's good stuff. Yeah, they, I, I've been really surprised that nobody's – I think they pushed Benda, but nobody's been able to overtake Benda. And right. I'll, that's a credit. That is, that is, that is a credit to Bender, no doubt. Uh, Sunday says more pressure, more interceptions. That is the that is the working theory, Sunday. But here's the, here's the interesting thing, Sonny, is that Texas has actually been a, a top ten team in the Power Five in pressures the last two years. But it's been in mostly interior pressure, right? You've had you know Kendra Colburn, more Ojimo, Byron Murphy, Javante Sweat. The hope is that you heard coach and um, my man CJ give their, you know, the crazy prediction that, you know, that it's coming from the edges, uh, Zena Omiyazulu and, and Colin Simmons, and that now the pressure from Texas, they'll still be able to create pressure, but it'll be coming from the edges. And it's a different kind of pressure. And then maybe that pressure will be more effective in Texas. Uh, creating more negative plays on the other side of the line of scrimmage, tackles for loss and sacks, but also creating more takeaways. And you could argue like, man, how is that going to happen? Well, like I said, it's the it's theory, uh, but the theory would be the pressure coming from the edges uh, that maybe it forces that quarterback up in the pocket. If you play more press man coverage, taking away the inside leverage, all right, you're taking away the inside leverage, you got better coverage defenders at their safety positions now, so your safeties can cover your the, the slots and cover the tight ends a little bit better. So theoretically, let's say you take away the middle of the field with your inside leverage on your corners on the boundary in the field and with your safeties now being able to play better coverage overall, and you force the quarterback who's stepping up in the pocket to have to throw where the only space that is unoccupied on the field is outside the numbers over the top of the cornerbacks. And that's a tough throw when you're stepping up in the pocket and a little bit on the move and have to do it. Now, I'm not saying that's how every one, every down is going to go. I mean, no, quarterbacks make plays and not every uh, not every play is going to go according to that. But theoretically, that's what you want to do. You want to force quarterbacks now to make the toughest throws on every passing down they can do. And the toughest throws are going to be those throws that are outside the numbers and and really the only only space that area that should be open is between the numbers and the sideline and the quarterback's feet are not set that's a, that only Joe Burrows are making throws like that when their feet aren't set and you're talking right. about quarter the best quarterbacks in the country making throws Caleb Williams making throws like that when their feet aren't set most quarterbacks if they're making that throw outside the numbers feet got to be set with the with the, the with a pocket all right, that actually is is sound around them and not one that's collapsing around them. So that's the, the hope is because they Texas hasn't been able to they weren't able to create a lot of takeaways and they weren't able to create a lot of sacks and negative plays, tackles for loss with that interior pressure. It did it didn't it was it was it was there, it was consistent, but it didn't lead to a lot of takeaways, it didn't lead to a lot of negative plays. And I think guys, that's ultimately what they want this season with the pressure coming from the edges you'd like pressure coming from everywhere ideally but they don't you don't have that that's tough i mean that that's georgia and that's ohio state texas ain't got there they're not there yet uh but right now the pressure from the edges the theory is that it may lead to more splash plays on defense yeah. i i, I, I would like to say this this rod and that and that along the same lines i i want to see what our what our new nil our, our new portal receivers are going to do in terms of adjusting to the ball, because a great receiver can make the throw look really good. Yeah. Because because if they have that knack to be able to know where that ball is going to go, that they can decelerate 
if the ball's a little short, they can decelerate, okay, to make sure. That's one thing that Xavier had trouble with two seasons ago. He, he couldn't adjust to the ball in the air. You had to throw it right to him while he was running because he did he wasn't experienced enough yet to be able to create yeah. to, 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 to keep that DB himself between the ball and the DB. And a great receiver can slow down or speed up. A lot of times they'll slow down enough to get the DB to slow down. Then they'll have a burst at the end to go get the ball instead of having a jump ball. So 50% of that, I'm going to say, is the receiver and his ability to almost be a basketball player. You know, when, when that ball's lobbed inside, can you shield off the defender where the ball, you know, can can get into your hands? Yeah, no, you're right, Coach. You know who did it real? A.D. Mitchell would do it really well. Yeah. Um, he did good. He would almost create space like a like an NBA point guard where he would create. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly, exactly right. right. That's exactly right, he, son. He creates this exactly. space. And, yes, he would all – I'm with you. I, I call it location acceleration where – he can be running, but hit another gear once he locates the football in the air and hit another gear to separate from the defensive back to help out his uh, quarterback for a ball that may have been considered underthrown or to be able to, like you said, shield off an, an almost big body that cornerback and create enough space for an underthrown ball to also be able to drop in a bucket. He'll, he'll, he basically moves the bucket for the quarterback. That's right. And, yeah, that's, just, that's a great point. <laughs> He's like, I'll, move great yeah, I'll, you know, I'll create the space for you, you know, based on my, his body control is amazing. AD's body control is so, it's so fantastic. And it, it, and he's combined that with his catch radius and it just makes, makes him so tough to defend. Uh, like I said, I, it, it, you know, I would have, uh, I mean, any DB would have a tough time with AD Mitchell, but the thing that makes AD Mitchell so tough to deal with is that he is great at running routes and creating separation that way, but he doesn't need separation to win. You can throw it up to him in a 50-50 situation, and he can still win. Most receivers are one or the other. They're contested catch guys, 50-50 guys, or guys that create separation. Like Romeo Dunze is that. He's both. Like he's like, I'm 50-50 ball, or I can create separation. A lot of guys aren't necessarily both. X-Man's not both. The X-Man's not a contested catch receiver. He's a he's a separation receiver. Right. AD, AD's both. AD can do both, man. Um, so, yeah, good good conversation there. Good point there, Coach. Uh, real quick, uh, before we get to some more of the questions, um, appreciate you guys. and Keep them coming. Let's thank another one of our sponsors. Uh, and I actually got a chance to visit Flat Creek Estate Winery. I, I'll, tell you about, I'll tell you about it here but after I give you a little message from Flat Creek Estate. But 11 awards in 30 days, including double gold grand reserve and Texas grand reserve at the Houston Rodeo. Flat Creek Estate Winery is raking in awards and it's just a few minutes from the heart of Austin, Texas. Select bottles of the wines by Flat Creek Estate are now available at your local specs. And now you can get a taste of what they're all about. Flat Creek Estate is also a gorgeous venue hosting events for the whole family all spring. Taking the, uh, you got, uh, you can take in a number of different events at Flat Creek Estate. Uh, they have their, um, they have their winemakers dinner you can always be a part of. And also all of the different uh, festivities they have there at Flat Creek. You can have Mother's Day out there at Flat Creek state that's actually something that i'm trying to arrange right now uh if you have a date weekend you can have a staycation out there at flat creek estate it is just a fantastic place so remember folks eat drink and be awesome at flat creek estate for more info visit flatcreekestate.com visit flatcreekestate.com and i was out there actually uh, me and bobby went out there earlier this week just to go visit our sponsors they were fantastic but that venue folks is unbelievable like it is what? It's great. One question. Go did, ahead. You, did you sample any wine? I did. No, I did sample. We had a spitter. All right. There was a spitter out there because I drove and drove back. So we had a spitter. And so you get to sample and taste and then you smell and you swish and then and then you had to spit. Now I did taste some wine. I, I did taste some. But I didn't <laughs> taste too much. I didn't I didn't overindulge. I wanted to make sure I was still all good. So we had a spitter there ready to go. But I do want to go out there again. It's a it really is a great venue, man. I would I, I'm actually trying to arrange a Mother's Day trip out there for my wife and actually for my mom coming in town. So uh, I'm getting out there to Flat Creek Estate, and I would encourage everybody else to do the same. Um, hey, oh, Rod, there, there ain't nobody in Burnett County who's getting that wine and looking at it swirling around. They, <laughs> they ain't doing that stuff in Burnett County where I'm from. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I go to I was trying to, baby. I, I was trying to be fancy. We, you know, we were out there with our sponsors. So, but usually, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the we same way. I see Bernie County. No, yeah, I don't. We, we, we ain't slosh, you know, wine around. <laughs> <laughs> we just drinking it right out of the bottle, baby. Boone's Farm style. You hey, know? hey, sometimes, yeah. coach, it ain't even need to be a bottle. It could be a bag. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, you know how that goes. Hey, man, that's, 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 that's right. really. Yeah, you ain't no kind of in Bernie County, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Flat Creek State, they are that it's legit. It's it's really great wine. My wine, my my wife loves wine, and she's actually enjoying a couple of bottles I got from out there. So thank you to the good folks out there, at Flat Creek Estate. Uh, all right, uh, yeah. Uh, all right, let's get to some more of uh, these questions here. Um, this comes from Cisco Diaz. Cisco, thank you for the question. During the BYU game, Texas used a three back set, and it was successful. Could we see that more with so much talent in the running back room? Thank you, Cisco, because you know I'm yeah, always I, down. I knew, Rod, Rod, Rod. <laughs> Thank you, Cisco. Rod, being heat on that one, baby. He's like, oh. Rod, did you take that one up? Asked. We had the screen for the uh, the the uh, the ad just now. Did you go ahead and you know type that one up while reading it? I, I know I did. I, I'm not. Uh, trust me, it's been up there for a while. I mean, it came in at four twelve, so I just let it go. I was like, you know what, we'll let it go. Because y'all know, y'all can think I'm just trying to start the show talking two back sets. But no, they have used the three back sets. They have used that 31 personnel package. And remember, they used it um, versus Alabama um, that year that Texas hosted Alabama in start second season. They, I think that's the first time I've I seen Texas actually break it out. So they have it in the package. And I do think it'll be some amalgamation of C.J. Baxter, of uh, Jaden Blue, and then what we hear from Trey Weiser, because they love what he's done. But I won't I won't talk about it too much, but I am hearing, and we'll get into some practice nuggets here from CJ in just a second. I am hearing that they are using more two back sets, more 21 personnel, more 20 personnel. And you guys know I've been yelling about that for about four or five years now. I think it's a great thing that they're using it in spring. The reason it will be good they're using it in spring, that would say it's more than just a, a, a boutique novelty thing. That would say now it's becoming more of a staple, all right? It's becoming more of a staple and a go-to personnel grouping for Sark. And that was not the case for Sark prior to his time with the Atlanta Falcons, following Kyle Shanahan and his 21 personnel, and Sark putting his spin on it, which was the pony package, which is two tailback sets instead of a traditional fullback. And in ever since then, at least since he's come to Texas, he has been using some of the same concepts, but also when he brought in Brendan Marion, who runs a go-go offense, a two-tailback set, which is a triple option run game that is uh, that is mixed with a, a West Coast passing game, Sark's offense, West Coast passing game. And now he's taking some of those go-go principles. It only makes sense. And you're, like you said, you're stacking the running back rooms. It's like you keep stacking that room. You ain't going to be able to keep all them guys unless you play them. So you got to play them. And the best way to play a lot of them is two-tailback sets. And I learned from Nick Saban, heard Nick Saban say it. So I think it's gospel at this point. He's the GOAT. He said, it is really tough to go against two tailback sets because we don't practice against it. We're practicing against spread sets now. We're practicing against a lot more pro style stuff. But even in the NFL, guys, guys don't run a lot of 21 personnel. That's still in the NFL. That teams are in the minority that are doing that, like the 49ers and the uh, the Miami Dolphins. That's it. That's teams that are in the minority. So you don't practice against it a lot. So what Nick Saban is saying is he said, we, these days we have to, if a team is running at, we have to designate special practice time just to go just to have them um, familiarize themselves with the angles of two tailback sets with the blocking of two tailback sets and the leverage points going up against two tailback sets because you never do it. And he even remarked that he had a game going up against Tennessee a couple of years ago. Tennessee came out in a goal line, in a goal line situation in I formation, just simple I formation, old school 21 personnel. He said his players didn't know how to line up. Had to call a timeout. Players didn't know what they were doing. Like, oh, hey, Rod, we, 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 don't see we need a Charles White on our roster <laughs> in that running back room. And then we can have our America package. We can have <laughs> red, white, and blue. Oh, <laughs> America package. Well done. Well done, go. coach. I love it. I'm all about it, man. I know somebody said I've never seen Cisco Diaz and Rob Bakers in the same thing. <laughs> 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 hey, hey, but hey, coach, I like that idea, man. Trust me, save you on red. And I'll say this, I'll be done with it. I do believe that Sark's trying to pull the okie doke on us. I think Savion Red gained that that weight for a reason. 
I think Sark wants him to be his version of Kyle Juszczyk, a modern fullback who can run routes downfield because he used to be a wide receiver, not afraid of physicality, which Savion Red is not. You can put him at fullback and probably not afraid to be unselfish and change positions because he's already done it. And what do you have to do to be at fullback? Unselfish because you're going to be blocking for people like a road Joe, like a power back. I think that's his plan. He won't let us in on it, and maybe I'm off, but I remember the first time I saw the 6-0 line package, and they asked Sark about it, and Sark said, yeah, we're just doing that for tight end depth. And I said, that don't make no damn sense. What are you talking about tight end depth? There's an offensive lineman there. You got better tight. What about Juan Davis? You got to feel like, oh, what the hell, man, coach? You, you're looking at tight end depth, and you put an old lineman in front of me? Nope, Sark was using his 6-0 line package, the Big 12, Big 11, and he didn't want to unveil it without troubleshooting it and testing it first. And then he broke it out versus Alabama later on that year. So Sark, every now and then, he wants to play a little coy, and I just think he, he he's not – He's, he's not being disingenuous. I just don't think he wants to reveal exactly what his vision is sometimes. I think he's got a vision for you for, uh, for my man, Savion Red. All right, I'm done. I'm done ranting about it. We, we're done talking about two tailback sets. Um, Daniel wants to know, any word on if the spring game is being canceled? I don't think they're going to reveal that before the day of because they wouldn't know. They, they can't trust the, the, the weather guessers. Because if they're wrong and it's a sunny day, people are going to be upset <laughs> uh, because they canceled their spring uh, spring game weekend. And if people are going to be in town, they have the old Bevo Boulevard thing that CDC has been setting up for months. And uh, there's, a, there's a lot involved. So even if the game doesn't happen, there's so much spectacle around it that I think they'll still go. They got a concert. Doesn't that concert, CJ, too? Oh, yeah. Longhorn City Limits. Kind of, it was. Yeah. Being constructed today, you know, they're having – they had meetings today, Chris Del Conte, the athletics uh, uh, department, Steve Sarkeesian. They had meetings today in case weather was too bad, what the plan would be. Uh, the, get, the best guess I have right now is they would ship everybody over to the bubble for the scrimmage. It'd be closed to the public, unfortunately. Um, media likely not able to attend either, and they would carry out the spring game quote unquote, in the bubble, uh, just to get those guys one more run through, one more live action uh, game situation uh, for the spring and then shut things down right after that. But that will be, again, at the 11th hour, you know, final minute decision. They, uh, Like you said, Rod, CDC and the Texas Athletics Department has put a lot of effort into uh, uh, the spectacle that goes on anytime there's a game at, at uh, DKR. So unless there's really bad weather and they cancel it ahead of times, it's going to be uh, a last minute deal. Right there. Uh, LL wants to know if two back is pony, what is three? It's a donkey. It's the donkey <laughs> package. <laughs> I told you what it is. It's America. America. Yeah, we America. get the red, white, and blue. Then you're right. We can get Jaden Blue, Save the Red, and then get some white in there. Then, yeah, white. we can go American package. I have a son right about now. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. I want to I want to call it the donkey. You got something better than the donkey package? Three of them is a donkey out there, man. I, just, hey, I was gonna go the other way, Rod. I thought you would call it the stallions or something. I mean, oh, that's good too. That's I mean, good. you got the pony and the stallion package. If you call it the okay. pony and the donkey, I'm looking at oh, we got it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah baby. What I, what I look like when I walk down on the field right there, Mr. Pullback. It's a mini horse. It's a miniature horse. I love that. Yeah, I, that was great. I, I like the stallion is better than the donkey. I think. Don't get just kind of funky, but you're right. Pat, Stallion is probably the better way to go there. Uh, all right. Hey, Travis. Travis hit us up. Thank you, Travis, for the super chat. We appreciate it. Can't wait to see y'all at Victory Lab. Yes, on Saturday, we'll be at Victory Lab. Uh, it's 11 a.m., I believe, we're going to be at Victory Lab starting up the festivities there. Since last time I talked to you, Rod, we were about K-State. You are right about K-State. Yeah, uh, that was that was a scary one. I knew we'd pull out that K-State win. I just knew, I knew it was going to be tight. I knew it was going to be tight. It certainly was. Always is with the purple kryptonite, man. Purple kryptonite. Always. It, TCU, same way. Purple kryptonite. I'm glad we're getting away from the purple kryptonite. Anybody in the SEC wear purple? Not really, right? No purple in the SEC? I don't think so. All right. We're good then. <laughs> uh, Not to okay. Clemson gets in. Let's, um, before we get done, one more sponsor I do want to thank here before we get done. Um, the showdown returns. Is talking about the SEC. 
Um, hot off the presses, gentlemen. Hot off the presses, ladies and gentlemen. Everybody can take advantage of this. There's a brand new commemorative edition uh, magazine available, The Showdown Returns. It's a season preview of the return of the uh, Texas Texas AM rivalry. Use the QR code. All right, use the QR code here for free shipping. All right, you can use the QR code for free shipping. You can also get the magazine at select grocery stores across the state. Again, use the QR code for free shipping for the showdown returns uh playing the aggies once again uh that was it was fun back in by day playing the aggies uh it, it, cj it's gonna be kind of new to cj cj is so young cj was a youngster when the when the robbery uh ended was it 2011 2012 how old were you then cj like 12 or 13 14 yeah 13 13 14 13, something like that yeah oh lsu, hey, right? LSU was cool. damn it He's right, we're Richard. Hammered. Damn you, we're Richard. Hammered on LSU. Oh my gosh, <laughs> what? Yeah, no, you're right. Hey, I, I was just asking the question about the purple. You're right. So hopefully the the purple kryptonite does not translate into the SEC. Had too much of it in the in the Big Twelve. But They're right, white LSU, and yellow. Yeah. LSU does have <laughs> LSU does have the purple. You're right. I pre thank you guys for hope but for keeping us uh, keeping us honest. We appreciate that. Uh, all right, a uh, couple of our uh, more questions, and then we'll get ready to wrap this thing up, gentlemen. Um, someone says, "Are there less running QBs on the schedule this year?" That is a good question. I believe there are fewer uh, dual threat quarterbacks. I got to go back and check, so don't just hold me to that. There's, I believe yeah. it's right. I mean, you think about it, CJ. Um, I got to go back and look. I believe there are fewer though. Overall. There are it, looking conference in Michigan, you know, your power five opponents, Alex orgy will be a running, a running quarterback. Uh, Mississippi state's going to be Blake shape in Texas is familiar with him. He's an agile guy. He can get outside the pocket. He's not super athletic. He's not a guy, uh, especially with his injury history that you're going to fear too much. Of course, Jackson Arnold, good athlete, not a great runner. Same with Connor Wegman, who Texas will play later on at, at, uh, at Texas A&M, uh, uh, again, Carson Beck, good athlete, not a, a runner by trade. Vanderbilt's going to have an interesting quarterback battle there. Graham Mertz, I mean, he's a Big Ten quarterback. He's not going to beat you by his legs. Uh, Arkansas, uh, I, I believe his name is Talon Green from Boise State. He's a good runner. He will be a guy Texas will have to game plan around a little bit. Uh, that'll be an interesting one. But this SEC schedule for the Longhorns in terms of quarterback athleticism, yeah. Very favorable. You don't have to play Jalen uh, Milrow. You don't have to play Brady Cook from Missouri. You don't have to play Jackson Dart from uh, Ole Miss. Those are probably the three biggest rushing threats uh, on good offensive teams that Texas dodged, and therefore you're looking at a schedule, at least from a running perspective, that favors the Texas defense in terms of their quarterback opposition. Yeah, no, you're right, because Dylan Gabriel, right, that was one of the ways they broke tendency, turned him into a runner, worked against Texas. We thought – that K State uh, would run a lot with Will Howard and with um, I forgot the young backup's name was really good. Um, for Avery them Johnson. Avery Johnson. Thank you very much. Uh, they really couldn't get the running game more because Texas game plan really well to neutralize uh, the threat they're running at quarterback. And um, Texas faced a couple more, but I thought Texas did pretty good. Other than obviously Dylan Gabriel against uh, quarterbacks who are running, but Dylan Gabriel was and that was that was the most yards he had rushed for, and I believe the most attempts he had in his career. So it was truly breaking tendency in Texas. Uh, wasn't prepared for it. It was a great move by them. Um, some LL says Florida probably has some DJ lagway packages by then. Um, that's a great point, too. Um, you yeah. could have quarterback changes by then or something like that. Uh, all right, one more question, and get, we'll get ready to wrap this thing up, gentlemen. Uh, Joseph here says, in terms of the transfer portal, could we start taking smaller classes that are made up of less developmental players and then supplement with the portal. Uh, what are your thoughts? I know Sark is big on still or the organic uh, recruiting of uh, traditional recruiting being the heart and soul, the lifeblood of the program, and you know using the transfer portal when necessary to supplement urgent needs of urgency in the roster. I think you're going to see you're going to see teams that are struggling, teams that are trying to get to the level of talent that we're at that are going heavy in the portal. I, I mean, w when you've got it ginning like we have it ginning right now, I think you're exactly right, Rod. You fill in some key spots with the portal, but I think uh, Sark is going to continue to to recruit high school players and develop them uh, and, and then just fill in as need be. Of course, 
you know, the great the great thing about it is as you continue to to have great recruiting classes, you don't have to hit them. You don't have to hit the portal. Yeah. You know, yeah. just just occasionally and like and you know, defensive line, and we've talked about this before, that's always going to be the toughest position to recruit. It really is. It, it's just it's really hard to find good defensive linemen that are active, that have good feet, that are aggressive. Um it's a toughest position in football to recruit, to find players, in my opinion. So I think you're you're always going to see us dipping in the portal for defensive linemen, uh, possibly. Other than that, you're just filling in holes. As, as I've said before on this show, there's times when I was at Texas, we didn't even, there wasn't even a, a recruiting prospect that we offered in the state of Texas because they're just so hard to find sometimes. We had to go outside the state. Man. to find the, the level of player that we felt like we needed. So uh, I think you'll continue to see us fill in spots, but there's no doubt Sark has already kind of drawn a line in the sand and said, I'm going to recruit great high school players and we're going to develop them. Yeah, no doubt. And you don't want to lose that relationship with the Texas high school football coaches, as uh, Coach Shipley can attest as well. <laughs> uh, that's a very personal one. Uh, okay, real quick, before we get out of here, thank you guys for the question. CJ, give the folks a couple of practice nuggets that you got from uh, from sources about spring practice for the Longhorns. Yeah, absolutely. Rod, we talked about it, the 12. Now, uh, we saw some 21 personnel as well. It was uh, today, it was Juan Davis and Gunnar Helm, the first two uh, guys out there uh, for the tight end position in 12 personnel, 21 personnel. It was uh, Trey Wisner as well as CJ Baxter. And you, you know, you saw CJ or you saw Jaden Blue filter in for Wisner every now and then. Of course, he both of them were used in terms of that motion guy yeah. uh, in which Keelan Robinson was likely in that role a year ago. Uh, really interesting. Again, not a super physical practice, but physical enough. Uh, the, I was told Matthew Golden had a great catch today, a one-handed grab on a corner route on a pass from Quinn Ewers for a touchdown in the red zone area. More of the same. The, re- the defense looks very good in between the 20s, but once you get into the red area, it feels like Sarkeesian's really starting to kick, uh, cook things up a little bit. Uh, Quinn Ewers having a really good day in the offensive line, you know, kind of having their way with the interior group there. So uh, the offense looking good in the red zone. Matthew Golden again, big catch. Uh, balls on the ground a little bit again today. It was an issue last Saturday. A pair of fumbles from Texas running backs, a couple of drops from receivers. We'll see if, you know, this pattern becomes a trend. Uh, but right now, just, you know, I, I think it's a little bit more of these guys hitting that spring ball wall uh, with the spring game being that final row or, you know, kind of yeah parade eventually. Yeah. No, good stuff. One, I, I interesting Juan Davis um, at that other tight end position along with Gunnar Helm. And I really want to see how much 12 personnel Sark is going to use this year without JT Sanders as his muse uh, with that offense because JT Sanders is such a matchup nightmare. I like Gunnar Helm a lot, like Juan Davis. They are not the matchup nightmare that a JT Sanders was. So it's going to be interesting to see what Sark does there. All right, any uh, closing comments here, gentlemen, before we get out of here? Coach, you got any uh, last comments for the people before we close it out? No, man, just to, as we've talked about earlier this week, it's an exciting time. I mean, this is, this is going to be, if the weather will hold out, it's going to be a, a really big crowd. I'm afraid the weather might keep some people from coming out, but I hope everyone will come out and support these guys and uh, we'll have a break in the weather. I think uh, one o'clock, uh, you know, I think the further you go in today from looking at, at, at my at weather app, the, the greater the chances are, and you get into a hundred percent that evening. So maybe we can get it in. I hope we can, but uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a fun day for us to see uh, who these guys are. And there's always going to be one or two guys that will really show some flash of brilliance and you'll go, Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, I wasn't thinking about that guy or I didn't know he could do that or whatever. And so I, I look for one or two of those guys to, to uh, try to make a name for themselves. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, all right, CJ, you got any last uh, news notes, nuggets, any last comments for the people before we close it out? Yeah, a couple things. Burnt Orange Horn, I see your comment. Uh, did Matt Golden have an option or a double pass today? Uh, in practice, he did. He found uh, Isaiah Bond for a touchdown on a double pass. So there might be your trickery a little bit. Uh, yeah. David Keith Williams, your comment about Gunnar Helm, I was told today he looks very much like a professional uh, on the Texas roster right now. You can tell he's been around the block a few times. He carries himself very well. He will be a guy that I was told will play in the NFL. Uh, and then on top of that, Texas will be receiving a big-time interior defensive line visit 
from Dominic Williams, April 23rd through 25th. That was announced just now by Hayes Fawcett. Of course, he'll be at Oklahoma spring game this weekend. Oklahoma's going to make a big push for Dominic Williams to, for, for him to be their only visit. Uh, this weekend. That will be the push for him. Of course, we talked about him entering the portal uh, a day ago. Texas is very interested here. He's a guy that's very disruptive. 19 pressures, three sacks a year ago, uh, plays, uh, what is it, 53% of his snaps in the A-gap, exactly what Texas is looking for nice. right now. He will be on campus uh, next week, early in the midweek for his trip to Texas. Of course, Colorado, LSU, Missouri, uh, Oregon, all other schools looking to get visits as well. But Big news breaking right as we end the winning drive here. Uh, Texas looking to get or at least add some help there to their defensive line group. That's an All-American, freshman All-American and All-Big 12 uh, selection right there, Dominic Williams. Right, good stuff there, CJ. Appreciate that. And also uh, appreciate all of you guys out there for joining us. Uh, appreciate all of your support. Uh, the On Texas Football family is growing. It's growing because of you guys. We also got to thank our sponsors again. We want to thank Flat Creek Estate. Uh, go to check out flatcreekestate.com. Also, we do want to thank uh, our wonderful sponsor, uh, our new sponsor, thecarrotconcierge.com. Go check that out as well, especially for Mother's Day. Um, and thank the good folks at the uh, the Showdown Returns. Don't forget about that fan, brand new uh, fan fantastic collector's item magazine um, that is paying tribute to the rekindling of the Texas, Texas and the rivalry. All right. For my man, Matthew behind the scenes too, doing a great job. He is the real MVP. This would not happen without him. He's fantastic. Uh, for my man, CJ golden for coach Bob Shipley. Thank you guys for everything. And until next time, hook them. <laughs>